Okay, the long-awaited Lawn Shaver of Silver Corp Metals. It's been, I think, uh, March last year or April last year since last we sat down to speak about Silver Corp. And a lot, has, a lot, a lot has happened since then. You've been through several battles in terms of MA, and uh, yeah. you've won. You've won a battle here now in the end. Um, and we'll get back to that. But I, I want to start off covering Ying because that's been really impressive to see the. The profitability that's been churning out of Ying, especially in the last reported quarters. I think, why don't we just kind of start high level and speak about what key activities has happened at Ying? Because there's a lot of things going on there uh, that people should pay attention to. Can you describe the key work that has been done? And we can get into profitability and so on later. Yeah, well, I, I with what we've got planned in terms of uh, evolving and transforming Ying for the future, we've been uh, embarking on a number of different projects. Um, so there's lots going on in different areas, uh, in the mining area, opening up the mines, ramp access. Uh, so on that point, uh, we are sort of halfway through a three-year plan uh, to invest in expanding the ramp access, opening up these ramps to get down into the mines, provide greater access, uh, which has a couple benefits. Uh, one, it's going to uh, lead to the increased mechanization that we're planning for mining of Ying. And I'll come back to that in a second. The other one is just, is just opening up access and making it easier to get down in the mines for a variety of management personnel to go and to visit different areas where the crews are working. Uh, before it, it was cumbersome at times uh, to get, uh, for example, the, the, the mine geologist to go down and visit a number of different stopes that are actively being mined to make sure that uh, things are being set up in the best way possible. So now we're going to have access for people to get down for supervision, um, but also now being able to get uh, trucks down um, and right basically to the loading pocket. And the reason that's important is that for... Um, uh, for many years now, the focus at Ying has been on a very selective cut and fill resuing mining technique, uh, which is great in terms of minimizing dilution, but it's labor intensive. And so you've got a crew of people down there. Um, it's, it's very selective. You're working in very narrow, tight stopes. You're mining, um, um, you know, tonnage of ore. Uh, it has to be, you know, manually pulled out and put into carts. And there's sort of multiple rehandling of people. And we recognize that going forward in the future, that's going to be uh, a, a difficult program uh, to run at the kind of scale that we want to run at. And so we're, we're shifting some of our mining methods over and we're bringing shrinkage in, which allows for a bit more bulk mining. And what it means is we can bring uh, bigger equipment down uh, for the, the drilling uh, rather than, you know, the jack leg where you have a guy holding the drill. Now it's a uh, it's mounted on a piece of equipment uh, from a blasting standpoint. We need to bring in um, LHD, so load haul dump. Uh, shovels to be able to scoop the ore up. And the benefit is, is you can shrink the crews down. And for the younger generation who are not as prepared to do that, uh, that hard labor that the, uh, the old guys are doing, you can hire a technician who will stand in the stope, has the sort of the joystick thing mounted, and he can control the shovel and shovel the ore out of the loading pocket directly into the ore trucks, which have now come underground. So really streamlining the handling, the process, cutting the crews down uh, and increasing the, the, uh, the throughput rate at all of the mines. You know, there will still be areas which are still, you know, based on their, uh, their nature in terms of their size and orientation going to be you know, mined the other way. So we're just going to redeploy the crews that we have to mine those, those areas. So, so those are, you know, some of the key uh, elements to opening up and getting better access to the mines, transitioning with some new equipment, transitioning some new mining methods. Uh, we're going to be bringing in some uh, a bit more uh, uh, long hole, even something that we, you know, we haven't had before in the mines. Now, once the ore is, you know, comes out of the, the mine, uh, now we have, um, uh, a little bit of a compromise or a sacrifice on the dilution end. So we may see a bit of lower grades, but we've got a way to address that in that we're, um, we're, we're looking to bring on the XRT sorting. 
So the game plan, and we have one in trial right now at the number two mill. So prior to running the ore through the full milling process, we can run it through a crusher and a sorter to help to upgrade the, the grade and eliminate some of the waste before it actually goes into the proper mill. We're looking at bringing two more of those sorters on actually at uh, certain spots on the mine site so they could actually treat the ore right out of the, um, uh, out of the portal, uh, right on site, and then uh, continue you know, to uh, deliver it to the mill. So, so that's going to be one element. The other element, and uh, it's become increasingly important this year, uh, is the capacity expansion. So the effective capacity at Ying has been 2,500 tons per day. Uh, a few years back, we discussed a plan to building an entirely new mill that would have added 3,000 tons per day in terms of capacity. What we've realized is that as an interim step, what was more economical was to just increase the capacity at our mill number two by 1,500 tons per day. Very modest cost, $7 million. And we're, um, uh, you know, we're almost done getting that completed. You know, if you look on our social media, we posted some posts showing the equipment, the buildings, the, the, the mill that's going in. And uh, what's uh, been very interesting, you know, you, you commented on the, the quarter we just passed. Uh, first time now we've actually had mining capacity exceed our milling capacity that we're carrying a more material uh, inventory of ore. You know, that's never been the case. We've always had excess capacity at the mill. Now we're actually showing that from a mining standpoint, we're going to get into more ore than our mill can handle. And that's the reason for this uh, expansion. So there's a lot of lot to unpack there. First of all, I want to kind of to make something quite clear because last time we spoke, that was 15, 16 months ago. This was the timeline you were communicating, and it has been held, which is kudos to you guys. Not always that you that you see this in terms of what what you said then has essentially played out in terms of what uh, you, you know the main capital projects, tailings dam, uh, as well as the mill, mill installation. So that's very good to see. But if we put it this way, let's do a bit of an, a small exercise. At least we can try to, to, to convey what this might look like at Ying. So if you had one of the mines initially, and then you convert it to this new, more mechanized, less labor intensive, but potentially a bit more dilutive, at least initially before the XR, XRT sorting, what would be the throughput increase potential when that has been sort of fully carried through? Of course, that's a process, but... If, if you say it's X before, it's 1.2X or 1.5X, just to give a sense of that first, then we can talk about the dilution, how that would be, whatever. Yeah, well, and, and it's uh, uh, it's not even a case of saying from one mine. So we have the seven mines, they're, they're all operating slightly differently. Uh, and even within each of the mines, some areas will be transitioned to more shrinkage, but other areas will stay cut and fill. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a portfolio of a portfolio of opportunities. Okay. But I think, I think the, um, the best way to look at it at present, and this is always, you know, an evolving situation. Uh, but what we're looking at is if, when you look at our, um, you know, our, our production, currently at um, and thinking of it in terms of silver equivalent based on just the silver and gold, not looking at the base metals. You know, we're looking at going from 8 million silver equivalent in this current fiscal year to 10 million um, two years from now. So, you know, 2 million, 2 million ounces on eight, obviously from a percentage standpoint, that's, uh, you know, that's over 20%. And, and what, what throughput or are you running at, the, at that point to project? Them? Yeah, no, we, and we don't quite get to the full um, 4,000 tons per day in the current planning. Now, it's also important to recognize that, you know, these, um, uh, these plans and these projections are ever evolving. And we are, we are constrained by 43101 in terms of what we can say. And so as we, as we map out these plans going forward, and uh, the reports we just published are, uh, um, you know, compliant with 43101. Uh, they can only speak to what they can see in terms of reserves in a mine plan that's been identified right now. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's going to evolve and change over time. So our, you know, our hope and our objective here is to, um, you know, get obviously to these projections, 
but then in the meantime, you know, we're continuing to drill, we're continuing to test, we're looking at new things, uh, that uh, new opportunities to grow production. You know, it would be nice if sort of every year or every two years we sort of uh, throw away the 43101 and come up with a new one. And that's that's our intention. Would it be fair to say this, Dan? So in two years from now, you're estimating that increase in in output in terms of metals. But in terms of volume of ore, most of that would, would be sourced from the Quan Peng mine incremental increase, I would assume. No, 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 no. It's from the existing. Like right now, we, have, we don't have in that 43101, uh, because we don't have reserves, 43101 reserves at Quan Ping. You know, we have no projections uh, for Quan Ping in our, in our go forward plan. Very good. So if we think about that, then when you said, when you mentioned this output increase, what would be the approximate estimation of actual average throughput being used and by the mill at that point? I think in rough numbers, like in rough numbers, when we look at sort of where we've been running, um, uh, and this is thinking sort of broadly, like we're looking at a, at a 25% increase in, in tonnage. Yeah. So just about 3K or something like this is, is the idea, or three, three and a couple of hundred. So you're uh, still left with like 700 tons per day capacity or something like that. That's, that's yeah, it, 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 that, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so with not, well, it's not in the plans and it's not in the projections. Um, if things go as we think they will, Quan Ping will make a contribution and chip away at that capacity. Precisely. And we may find, we may find ourselves in the situation once again to say, okay, we expanded our capacity. Uh, we based on 43101 and what we have brought ourselves up close to, but not quite at that capacity. Now with Quan Ping and other factors and, you know, further uh, improvements uh, from the mines, you know, we're at or potentially through that capacity and we'll find ourselves in that, uh, you know, um, uh, attractive problem of saying, okay, we've got further ability to grow here. You know, how, how, how do we want to do it? Yes. So, so, so Quan Ping, and just to give people a sense, what kind of throughput would you, and, and this is a project for next year, to be clear. So, Maybe we can just start there. What's the timeline for Quan Ping, roughly, that you guys are thinking about? And what is the sort of potential in terms of what throughput you think that, that buying could handle? Once, once well, it, it's, it's, pre, it's premature. Like we know, we know what we're sort of allowed to from a governance standpoint and from a permitting stand, a standpoint. But to you know, speak to production throughput right now um, is... Um, is a bit premature um, because you know we, we haven't tied that up. Like we're we're trying to govern ourselves by you know the rules and following forty three one hundred and one, and so that's when we you know we speak to our production profiles in the technical reports. That's the best snapshot at the current time, with the view that uh, the actual mine plans may vary. They're going to evolve. We're going to see new opportunities. Um, you know, Quan Ping isn't in those plans. You know, we think there's reason for why we're going to break ground, you know, later this year, early next uh, year in terms of calendar uh, to basically develop down into what we believe will be ore zones that we can start to process development ore. I think the way of viewing, you know, Quan Ping right now is, is uh, to think of it as um not the best of the Ying mines in terms of size and output and not the smallest, but somewhere in the middle. Yeah, which would mean a couple of hundred tons per day or something once up and running, like two or three hundred. Yeah. That would be my estimation. Yeah, I, I think that that'd be a fair assessment. I'm, I'm hoping we can get a higher than that, uh, you know, based on, on what our uh, allowable permit numbers are. But, but I think if you think of it as bringing on another sort of average Ying mine, uh, that's the, another sort of increment. So if it, you know, we're at seven mines and it becomes the eighth, you can kind of do the math to think of what that percentage increase could be. And, and I think quite important for me to crystallize and highlight for myself is that when we spoke about this last time, which is a long time ago again, uh, now it's quite clear. I mean, the terms in which we spoke about the ramp up at Ying then sounded a bit more far into the future than it does now. Uh, put it that way. So now I, I think it, it's very realistic to reach 4,000 or reach new capacity in a much nearer time frame than what we were, were discussing back then. And this just goes to show that good good assets tend to get better with time, right? And 
Yeah. Well, and and uh, and to be fair, um, <laughs> like in each of these situations, like a lot of work has gone into preparing for all of this and to allow for this. Yeah. And that's, you know, technical work, uh, that's permitting work, that's uh, preparing all the studies that are necessary to get all of the approvals, you know, to be able to go forward and to do this. This isn't um, sort of like a haphazard process. Hey, we'll just give this a try. You know, there's a lot of work, a lot of study that has to go into that and uh, a lot of regulations to be met. So our teams have been very busy working through sequentially, like all the items that need to get done for this. And then... We shouldn't linger too long on the topic, and it's not something you've pushed super aggressively yet because it's going to take time to mature, but the new style of mineralization, which has been discovered, could you just kind of talk about what that, you know, what that means for Ying? And yeah, well, I mean, what, it, what, it's, what it's led to, uh, and we have another, we have another uh, sort of discovery, and that, again, comes from the, uh, the benefit, this multi, multiple benefits of the ramp access. Uh, we have yet another discovery of, of a different form of mineralization, different structure. So, you know, just to, to, to recap, what we've typically been mining have been very uh, near vertical, narrow vein, high grade silver lead zinc veins. And uh, in one of the mines in particular, um, it was, again, based on uh, ramp, disc, you know, access through ramping, we saw these shallow dipping structures in the LMW mine. And some of them dipped to the north, some of them dipped to the south, it's a completely different mineralizing event. Uh, and they've got gold and one of them's uh, gold copper. So uh, we've, we've sort of built up from a, uh, from a mining standpoint, uh, and a psychology of people, you know, tackling how to mine these vertical structures. We've basically retooled and retrained a, a group of people to be able to understand and execute on um, a room and pillar method to basically go after these shallow dipping structures. We added a, a gravity concentrator to our mill number one, and that's what's allowed us to now start pouring uh, Dore on site. And so, you know, we're, we're producing gold on site. Uh, I would still say it's a sort of growing um, uh, side business. Um, that, that, yeah, it's a startup. That's right. It's a startup within established within an established business. Um, we've been doing more drilling. We've identified these zones. I think there's more potential to understand uh, their extent, whether we have them in the other mines and where and how. And then, uh, as I mentioned, um, the ramping down that we've done actually uncovered another uh, set of different shallow dipping uh, veins, which I, I think are more uh, base metals rich. So, so the picture keeps evolving here in terms of what we have. The important thing from, uh, from, from our standpoint is uh, maintaining and growing our production rate for what people expect from us, and then seeing how these other opportunities can be incremental and additive to, uh, to you know, grow our metal output, whatever metals they are. And if it's gold and silver, that's great. Um, but there's, you know, opportunities in, obviously, in, in copper, seeing copper in, in some of these structures. Uh, if we add Quan Ping and that uh, makes a contribution, great overall throughput up, metal portfolio expands and diversifies. You know, I think we're just growing this uh, asset into a larger, more significant operation. I guess the question becomes what when the silver corp changed their name to something more general in terms of metals well I know and and i think um i think we've uh we've come to terms with that and we're ready for that at the right time um but, but uh and and obviously once we're um once we've built and are operating our, you know, our next mine in Ecuador and look at, you know, that being uh, a, a meaningful contribution to our uh, revenue profile, adding uh, copper revenues to the mix. Um, you know, we, we can, uh, we can think about if we change the name right now and then our, our next deal took us again in a completely different direction, you know, we, we might be premature in changing the name. So we should probably wait exactly. a bit. Maybe silver sounds just uh, is ripe for next year and, you get that back into the mix and silver remains dominant, who knows? But we'll get well, back to this in a minute. I, I want yeah. to really highlight and push the profitability at, at Ying. So maybe you can pull up a slide to, to, to start that conversation. So th this, is, this is corporately, and obviously as we talked about, Ying is the, the majority con contribution you know, to our results. Yeah, we've had this slide, we've used it for many years. Um, 
in some ways, I think we've kind of gotten a bit bored of having it in the in the in the presentation. Uh, but uh, what it's done for us is uh, really highlight something that's very important uh, for uh, investors in the mining sector. And so, you know, there's a lot of lines uh, on this page, but I think the key thing in terms of the, our recent experience is the silver price, which is the purple line, and that's the only one on the right axis. You, you can see that over the years, it hasn't been a great performer, it established sort of a new level, you know, in the, in the, in the 20s. And now we've seen an uptick in the silver price. Uh, the great thing is that the blue line, which is our, our revenue line, and it's a revenue you know, per ton of output. So like we're looking at this, not just gross aggregate revenues, because you can grow your revenues, um, to, you know, two ways is price and volume. So, so looking at this on a, on a per ton basis looks at kind of the quality of the rock that you're delivering based on pricing and grade. So we can see that the price has had an impact on our, on our revenue per ton. And then a good business should be able to increase prices uh, without costs increasing at the same rate, because otherwise, what's the what's the point of it? So the red line is looking at that at that cost element and our on sustaining cost to produce that ton of rock, and um, you know we've been able to keep that reasonably consistent. So you know the elegance of this situation is that the revenues have gone up, we've kept the costs flat, so the margin, the profit, the green line has shown that uptick. And that's what you know helped deliver what was, uh, I would say, uh, industry-leading um, results for the June quarter compared to many of our peers. Yes. So if we just highlight one thing here for people, so the last reported quarter, you if I got the number straight, here, but you reported 40 million operating cash flow, about 20 million net income, and for the entire fiscal 24, you reported 92 million operating cash flow and 40 million net income, which means that the Profitability seems to have increased by sort of yeah yeah percent uh, yeah on a unit basis, which is tremendous. Can you kind of unpack that those figures for us? Well, well, I I think you've done a great job of it. If you look at that ninety that ninety two number that you quoted, uh, the trailing cash flow when you, you know, when you look at it from um, uh, including the the June quarter is over a hundred million. Yeah, and, and so with what we're seeing in silver pricing, our volume increases. Um, you know, we're, we're growing and we're, we're, we're demonstrating that uh, the price increases are falling to the bottom line. Well, I don't mean to be a sucker for silver corp, but uh, this is what a great business looks like in the mining industry. Yeah. Well, and, and, and this is, again, one of these slides in our presentation that sometimes is kind of like, okay, <laughs> is this a boring slide or is this a good boring slide just because of the fact that, uh, you know, through those years, and again, you know, you saw silver prices haven't been great through that whole piece. Uh, we've, you know, continually delivered, you know, positive net income, you know, other than that, uh, that COVID quarter, which uh, obviously hurt, uh, hurt everybody. Uh, I'd say actually hurt us less, ironically, than, than most. And from a free cash flow standpoint, you know, we're still delivering strong free cash flows, even in what I described to you was a heavier expenditure year uh, because of the things that we're doing at Yang. Right. So, so just to get back to the, um, to the kind of the, the capital project, so tailings Dam, you're, you're mostly completed with, with, with the construction here. You have like 10, 15 million left. And yeah. And uh, yeah, we've, the mill is essentially operational or start, starting to be operational in, in a couple of months from now. Correct. November is the, the target date, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and what's, what's also very uh, you know, interesting is um, if you saw from the, the quarterly results, typically the calendar Q1 because of Chinese New Year has been the slowest quarter. Yes. Because uh, of the shutdown that, that we have. Okay. Um, with the expanded milling capacity and carrying um, a bit of uh, ore inventory into that quarter, uh, we may not see the same kind of seasonality that we've seen in past years. 
Uh, and remind everyone what, what kind of usual, what's the average seasonality? Of course, I have my models here, but remind everyone what. what, what well, the, if, if you think of it from a production standpoint, you know, we lose a minimum of two weeks where the mines are shut for two weeks because of people going on holidays. And there's the inevitable ramp down leading up to that point where people start to, uh, to, to some people will leave early because they've banked extra holidays. And then there's when everyone gets back on, it's not like a mine, you can just flick a switch and it's back running at uh, 100%. So, so it's kind of a minimum, uh, you know, two weeks out of, you know, what, what's a quarter, 12, four times three, 12. Yeah. So, so you lose like so, uh, 20% or, or something like this. Of, of, uh, yeah. And, and then, and, and because of the ramp down ramp up, uh, you know, you have that, uh, it's probably a bit more than that. So, so I think we, you know, we might see, uh, this upcoming quarter, uh, fourth quarter, um, uh, not be down or, or not, not show that same seasonality just because of uh, the mines ramping up their production rates and the fact that with the extra milling capacity to be able to run the mills during that period, uh, we, you know, we can uh, keep our production output up. I mean, it's fair to say that you, you, you're on track to do the next kind of the, the, the next fiscal year is looking to be the record year by far for Silvercore in terms of uh, cash generation. So it's, uh, it's very good to see. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I want to ask on as well is what are the analysts kind of how how have they revised their models for Ying in the last in the last couple of quarters? I would assume that they would have would have had to do that because when I spoke with you last, when we started building our model, I, I remember that the estimations for ramp up were were very conservative back then. So I wanted to to understand how they have sort of modeled the the evolution of Ying into into their calculations. Um, I think it's a mix. Some of them, some of them have given us more credit for the increases. Some of them have waited for the uh, the technical reports to be published. Uh, and from a timing standpoint, uh, they got actually published uh, in a heavy conference uh, season. So I, I think um, I think some of the analysts have been a bit um, um, well, slow or haven't gotten around to you know revising their forecasts up. Uh, but now things that have settled down for us as well, you know, we can uh, circle back and uh, address any questions uh, and get them to reflect the best, you know, the best possible picture that they're uh, prepared to uh, to show. So, so if we look at the, maybe you have a, have a have an idea of this. So, how has the NAV for Ying evolved since sort of early last year? Because we spoke about that then, about the analysts are estimating has has Ying grown in value in their calculations obviously it's quite clear that it definitely should uh, but I'm, I'm just wondering if they've actually started to uh, recognize this well well i think um <laughs> i think what we've proven and uh and again this is sort of looking at it from an average standpoint uh i can't remember uh, off the top of my head, what from the technical reports the NAV was for Ying in the report that came out uh, that was published in September of 2022 based on year-end 2021 numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would argue that at every point in time when we publish an update, the NAV doesn't really go down, but we have two years of production, two years of cash flow generation, asset building. Uh, so I, I think that, um, you know, we've done a good job of, of preserving the mine asset NAV while we've grown the NAV in other areas. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes. Just to, to make things clear, I guess, I think uh, you're on track, you're on track now to sort of do Potentially, if, if if the pace continues for for this entire twenty five fiscal twenty five year, to potentially potentially break a hundred million in net income for 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 from the mine, uh, or even corporately for the year. But at least uh, the cash generation could be something like that. Which, you know, that's that's uh, one doesn't have to be a genius. Then, if if you would be comfortable extrapolating that out, and it sounds like to me that the the story for Ying will have a tendency to be, become even better rather than not uh, in the future. You even mentioned how the potential of, you know, down the road, maybe in two or three years from now, adding another 1,500 ton per day mill uh, to the operation. That, that's kind of in the conversation, at least, although it's not going to happen next year, but uh, probably, but uh, 
it's in the conversation, which it was not four, yeah. 12 months ago. Well, a, a big expansion would be going back to mill number three, which we still reserve the right to do. Uh, a, a smaller, further optimization. You know, I can't, I can't predict what that might, you know, look like. Whether that's a retooling of mill number one, and increasing the capacity, modernizing that. You know, we'd have to look at, at everything in, you know, in context. I, I think coming back to the the question you raised is, from a, um, you know, an NPV standpoint. You know, the Yang NPV I think was 670 million uh, off this most recent technical report which we don't think reflects the full upside in the production capacity, doesn't reflect Quan Ping's contribution and is done at, you know, right now, what would be argued, you know, more conservative metals prices, silver prices in particular. Yeah. And, and so, is, that, is, that, is that figure attributable to Silver Corp and uh, recognizing the ownership that you have in the mines. Now. Yeah, that, that that would be a hundred percent basis on the mines. So so the attributable would be, um, and again, it's eighty percent for some of the mines and seventy seven point five for some of them. Just below eighty percent. So it's yeah. easy for people to to recognize. But then still, you you, you run numbers. You have your 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 big cash. One can quite quickly get to a sense of uh, valuation. But uh, we'll we'll get back to that at the end. Now let's let's first of all just talk about loans and the Silver Corp's corp development journey that has, because we haven't spoken to you for a while now. You've been through uh-huh. a couple of public ones and you've looked at probably a dozen other in the same time frame. So you just talk about this time and this experience. Uh, yeah, well, no, it's been a, it's been a very uh, challenging time. And, uh, you know, it's sort of ironic how things come full circle. Uh, because if you look at uh, how uh, these deals and the ones in the past, um, uh, you know, have sometimes come about early introduction, a first look, things go away, they come back, circumstances change. You know, so if we look back a year, uh, it was at, um, at the BMO Mining Conference that we uh, met with Orcorp. And uh, we had met with Orcorp many years ago at, at uh, the same conference and sort of said, well, that's interesting. We'll keep an eye on this. When we, uh, when we met uh, just over, uh, well, at last year's conference, um, sorry, the the um, the uh, conference in 2023. We realized that Orcorp had made great progress in the, the technical studies on the on the project, and most importantly, you know, as it relates to um, you know what our objectives are, they'd received the permit to build a mine, and I think that's the key catalyst. That when you look at you know our main. Um, you know, our main focus in this uh, this M and A adventure is to find projects that we can get you know buy and build. Mm. So that kicked off a process through 2023. Obviously, we launched the deal in August. Uh, got complicated last fall when the implied value of our offer you know floated with the market and all the mining stocks came under pressure. Uh, co- a competitor came out to uh, to challenge us uh, for Orcorp switch strategies. Uh, so really on that, you know, we did two deals, really, if you think about it, because we had set everything up to run a deal that was a, a vote by shareholders. And then when it became apparent that we wouldn't win the vote, the strategy was to switch to a tender offer so that we could make available our higher valued consideration to shareholders in a tender situation. Uh, ultimately, you know, I think what we were uh, dealing with with uh, the shareholder base was a um, a comfort with consideration even lower than the implied value of our deal at the end um, in Australian dollars, mm. rather than taking Australian dollars and shares in a company uh, like ours trading on the TSX and the NYC American. Uh, so that led to. Um, uh, a challenge, you know, winning support for the deal, but we did, um, you know, we did uh, benefit from the market uh, supporting the value and pushing along with those shareholders to get an extra two and a half cents out of the competing bidder. And when it became apparent that we weren't going to get traction on our tender, um, you know, to the extent that we would need to to be able to drive forward, you know, we uh, switched gears and uh, obviously tendered to that offer. Uh, by the competitor, and again, you know, made some money on our fifteen uh, percent stake and the break yeah, fee. So, so, 
in, in total, with the break fee and the stake, how much do you think you would have profited on, on the pros? I think about 10 million US. 10 million US. Not too yeah. bad, eh? Not too bad. Yeah. And, and then if we go back to um, to uh, Celsius as well, uh, what, what, what were the key learning lessons with that one? Because it wasn't too long between the two either. Well, I think the um, you know the the thing with uh, Celsius was you know from our perspective we uh, we thought it was an interesting project we uh, thought it had potential um, there were similarities to that project to our GC mine in terms of the size the scale the type of environment uh, so we felt that we could have built a, a very attractive. Uh, underground copper gold mine in uh, you know at uh, at uh, MCB. Um, we provided a bit of initial funding um, in terms of a private placement. Uh, announced the terms of uh, the intended transaction, and then ultimately we were not able to arrive at an agree on those on those terms. So that deal didn't uh, proceed. So one can see here, I mean, you tried, you tried Tanzania, you tried the Philippines, but you landed on Ecuador. So you guys have been very agnostic in, ter in terms of jurisdiction. You've been yeah. all over the place. I, I think it's, I think it's open-minded. I think it's open-minded to look at the merits of the project and the merits of the actual situation on the ground to see whether or not that, uh, that it looks and feels like a project that we can build. So let, let's just do the high level first. What is the case that you saw in Adventus? Just describe it, the timing and so on, how it kind of slotted into when the Ansaga didn't play out. What, what was the case you saw there? And well, I, I think, I, I think it, it, was at the, it was at this year's conference that uh, met with uh, management of Adventus that, uh, that we know. Um, um, we know quite well. We've followed the project over the years. And it's been an interesting project, and we've seen sort of the natural fit with us and our strategy. Uh, the thing that became apparent, you know, early this year was the the key game changers were one: they had received their permit from the Ecuadorian government to go ahead and to build the mine. And as we've talked about, that's a, a key element for us. We're no, we're not looking to buy projects that we have to put on the shelf and sit and wait and deal with uncertainties of permitting timeframes. You know, we're keen to get going and to deploy our capital and our expertise to build a mine and mm -hmm. expand our, our production footprint. So the fact that they had the permit was a, um, you know, a key catalyst for us. And, and then it was expl explained to us that there was um, a dual track process, a dual track strategy being uh, pursued, which was either, you know, A, to find the missing equity, the missing funding that was going to be needed to move ahead and transition from developer to producer, or B, they were going to look at some kind of a strategic transaction, an M&A transaction. And that uh, there were other parties that were looking, and if we had any interest in this asset, you know, now would be the time that uh, we should take a serious look at it. So that's what, that's what we did. Uh, so uh, we didn't quite yet know what the Orcorp outcome was going to be, but we kicked off the, the review process through March and got into the data room and uh, um, did uh, did our review and due diligence of the project and, and the other elements. At the beginning of April, we realized that uh, Orcorp was not coming our way. So um, we went on um, uh, the site visit to go down to Ecuador to see the projects. Uh, upon return, continued our due diligence, and then that's what led to us being able to sign the definitive agreement at the end of April. Right. And then just briefly, there, there were some kind of post-drama there with, with uh, some activist, activist group. Can, can you just kind of touch upon that and uh, what happened there? What, what's your well, yeah, but basically um, in the midst, so in between the signing of the definitive agreement to acquire it and to close on the deal, uh, very well timed. A, a group uh, came out and challenged the validity of the permit by uh, basically taking the government to court, saying that the government had not fulfilled its obligations uh, in terms of requiring and facilitating a property community consultation. Mm. 
And so then that uh, that got taken to court at the local level um, in the uh, the canton where the project was based. And the um, it was defended by the government, the minister Ministry of the Environment, and and uh, uh, Adventist and its subsidiary effectively was an interested party also participating in the, in the defense against that case. Right. So, and since then, your relationship with the leader, the president of the country, and the leadership in Ecuador has grown. You have have had meetings and so on. Can you just describe your impressions with? Ecuador and the leadership there currently is to give people a sense of it because it's not the yeah, jurisdiction that has the best reputation necessarily, I guess, historically, but uh, things are changing. Eh? Yeah, well, I think I think um, um, there's been there's been peaceful times, but not necessarily the best administrations in Ecuador mm -hmm. over the years. Sure. And it's obviously got very you know noisy with the change of the government and Naboa coming into uh, into power, but I think um, you know what we see in his leadership is a um, uh, a leadership focused on setting things right for the country, a recognition that the country can and should you know be doing better than it is for its people. Uh, there's a you know some a number of, uh, of of issues that they have to overcome, and uh, I think there's uh, you know I've used the the term you know reluctant politician. Uh, you know you have a politician here who's who hasn't been you know career aspirations to be president of the country, but is really stepping into what is a difficult role and to make difficult decisions, uh, sort of almost out of a civic duty to make his uh, to make his country better. And uh, it's also, you know, it's refreshing. Pardon me? I said a, phil a philosopher king or something like this. Well, I think a more of a more of a, a pragmatist, a pragmatist saying, um, you know, I, ha I have a pride for my country. I think my country can be doing better. Uh, the people of the country deserve better than what they've been uh, dealing with in terms of uh, living situation, you know, in terms of uh, crime, uh, gangs, unemployment. And so, so you you have a guy who's come in, and he's he's quite young, uh, and I think he resonates with the you know the shifting demogra uh, demographics of of the country, and is presenting you know a no nonsense let's get this company back on its feet in terms of the the right kind of principles, so that everyone in the country can benefit from that, and that's very refreshing, uh, and what's Nice from our standpoint is the recognition, you know, at the upper level and through other ministries is that mining uh, can and should be a bigger contributor, like proper large scale mining, um, um, you know, should be a bigger contributor to the economy like it is in the neighboring countries. Uh, the experience yeah. in, in Ecuador for the two mines that uh, larger scale mines that have been built, I'd say, has overall been a positive one in terms of lifting the areas that uh, those mines are in, uh, in terms of living standards, you know, generating uh, tax income, uh, spin off jobs, other benefits. And so uh, I think what we have to, is an opportunity at El Domo to do the same thing uh, in both of our province. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, and I and I think what's very good is that mining is it seems to be an active part of the of the of the conversation in terms of revitalizing the economy and and creating jobs, which is very good. I, I guess for me, it, I guess it's all in terms of creating a safer country and really changing a big change in in South America for me would be El Salvador, I guess, and kind of the comparable how they turned their country essentially in a few years from the highest crime per capita country to yeah. one of the lowest. And that might be the same kind of a duplication that's going on. That's at least my feeling in Ecuador. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's exciting to see. Uh, yeah, there's uh, I'd say there's there's change going on in a number of the Latin American countries, and and uh, th that's a good example of, of a dramatic change. You know, there's other countries that are going through a bit of an evolution. Uh, the the style and de the delivery of it is is different in in each location, yeah. but I, I think there's a recognition um, that. Um, you know, new, new thinking, new ways, uh, new governance is, is needed.
Perfect. So let's let's start off just for people who are not familiar with Eldomo first. Let's just start up and showcase what that uh, will look like for Silver Corp in terms of economics. Maybe you can pull up a slide for that. So I think uh, you know, as I as I mentioned, uh, Eldomo is permitted, and so that's been a key driver. You can see that's um, you know key highlight on the slide. Uh, has an investment protection agreement with the government of, of Ecuador. Uh, and then when we look at the feasibility study that was completed in 2021, you know, we think um, we think it's still valid uh, in, in many in many ways. And we're not looking at a lot of changes in it. So it, from an open pit standpoint, it's a 10 year life. Uh, you can see the mix in terms of uh, 11,000 tons of copper, uh, 26,000 ounces of gold. Uh, you've got zinc, silver, lead. And if you look at it on a copper equivalent basis, um, the, the cost to produce that equivalent pound is $1.26. Now, initial CapEx, $248. Um, we're actually, we've been doing work on this uh, prior to uh, the deal closing and post-closing. Uh, we're finding a number of ways, a number of areas that we think we can generate some savings. So uh, we think that this number is still valid. We might be able to do better than that. That's our internal target. But the project uh, does come, you know, with a financing structure, you know, embedded in it, and that is the Wheaton Stream. So uh, the Wheaton Stream entitles them to 50% of the gold and 75% of the silver. And we'll get, you know, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but they... Um, uh, are required to make another 162 million in cash payments towards construction. So when we take that 248 and look at that funding, you know, it leaves us with a very manageable number in terms of capex that we can fund out of cash flow. And again, you know, this is the difference of operating company versus a developer. A developer can't get started until they can point to having all the money lined up. Uh, we can actually get started and just start paying for things to get the construction going out of cash flow. Uh, we're doing uh, a lot of planning post-closing. There was a uh, extensive trip uh, down to Ecuador to meet with a, a number of parties. We're doing a few things right now before we kick off what we'll call the, the formal construction. Uh, we're doing a bit of metallurgical testing. We think there's an opportunity to tweak the flow sheet slightly, and that will lead to greater gold and silver recoveries to the copper concentrate. So overall, recoveries for precious metals would be higher, and having them in the copper concentrate is definitely advantageous from a payables uh, standpoint. Uh, we're looking right now at site infrastructure, location of the different elements, um, where the access roads, different bypass roads are going to be. Uh, and we're in the midst and working on the power solution because we need to uh, construct a line to bring power um, up into the region and to the site. Um, with all of these things comes the detailed engineering design. Uh, you have a feasibility study done, but that does not give you sort of the recipe to actually go and build the, the full facility. So, so we're advancing the detailed engineering. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, both in, in terms of uh, um, a trip to China that involved a number of people before closing and the trip to Ecuador, we're looking into a range of, of uh, equipment vendors, um, many, many of which that we deal with already, uh, including for our Ying mill expansion. Uh, so we're looking at equipment vendors that, um, you know, we believe can, you know, deliver what we need on time, on budget, and also talking to uh, various contractors that can uh, be involved in, you know, the site infrastructure and the actual mine stripping. So with what we're seeing, we're not seeing a lot of deviation, and we're still targeting our first production in 2026. Right. So, so the the average sort of annual cash flow profile. What does it look like? We can see yeah. So, is. so so in terms of uh, running the projections, you know what we've done is we've prepared this slide to look at on the left hand side off the current technical reports that we have, what the projections are in terms of revenue, and you can see what the mix is, and so we can see growing from you know th um, uh, you know where we are. Um, 175 million in, in silver going to, you know, just under 200 million in a, in a couple of years and adding on the right hand or in the middle uh, an Eldomo contribution from revenue, uh, we're adding about 50% uh, in terms of to the revenue mix and adding a contribution of that uh, 152 million increase, uh, roughly half of that is um, copper which is obviously a metal that is lacking in our portfolio on the left-hand side. 
Uh, but it does uptick even after the stream in terms of our gold exposure. And it also adds to uh, zinc and minor additions to uh, lead and uh, silver. Okay, so so so, so um, let's just discuss some of the more important parameters here, I guess, for investors. So quickly, again, you think you can, you can save on CapEx from the feasibility study figure or the technical report figure that stands currently? Uh, could you give a sense yeah. of what, I mean, could you get it down to, could you get it down 20 million or what's the ballpark we're talking about? Um, you know, I, I think I'll be, I'll be cautious in projections. Uh, I know what our internal target is, uh, but I know if I, if I communicate that and, and, you know, we miss it by 5 million and even if we've done a great job at trimming it, it'll be a miss off of new expectations. So I, I think I'll, I'll sort of reserve my right to, uh, to not uh, give that number, but, um, you know, I do think we can get it down from the 248, which is a direct benefit in terms of, you know, what it eliminates in terms of our funding. Uh, and the Wheaton contribution does not change if we get the CapEx down. So that, that's important to know. I, I guess the Silver Corp goal is for, for Wheaton to pay for the entire thing. Well, I, I think that's a little optimistic. Uh, um, yeah, of course, but, it's but I, a joke. But, but I mean, nevertheless, yeah. it, 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 it's, it's very funny that uh, uh, something like this, the, it's almost laughable how, how little you, I mean, not laughable, but it, it really is financially very easy for Silver Corp in this regard with this financing package. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, you, with the, you, I mean, you have over 200 million cash on hand on the balance sheet. So it's like, oh, right, this is... Uh, and we're going to get back to this. You can keep on going in terms of being continuing, being fairly aggressive on the M&A side, potentially. We'll get back to that conversation. But yeah. I just wanted to, to highlight that quickly. Yes. And, and then in terms of the potential impact of the methodological, and we don't need to say what, what you guys think, but c- could you give a sense of, of uh, say, a 1% or 2% increase, and let's just convert everything to copper equivalent recovery or something like this. It's a bit of, bit of a stupid exercise, I know, but just give a sense of what the impact potentially could be on economics with, with incremental methodological improvements, if you have a sense of it. Uh, well, we've run the numbers internally, and again, you know, rather not sort of start to lead people on something that we're not 100% certain on yet, because again, you know, what is projections become then expectations, uh, but but it does it does make for what would be uh, you know zero or very nominal uh, you know changes from a capital or operating cost standpoint you know does have a positive you know impact on the economics um, to us and and to we to be honest yeah but I mean this is a fairly high margin project I mean as we know one can run calculations like this but for example. If you have an NSR, which is kind of similar to uh, a, an increase in recovery, I would say, in the traction to gain, uh, at a lower margin project, for example, a 1% NSR can be fairly substantial to what the profits ter- turns out to be. Might not be as substantial for a high margin project like this, but nevertheless, a, a 1% ease- increase in recovery is going to be a lot more than a 1% increase in profitability. So there's significant leverage to to such incremental improvements to profitability. Yes, I mean there's uh, there there's multiple elements to this. Uh, the the positive elements obviously are the recovery overall. Uh, then there's payability factors for the metals depending on which concentrate they're in. Uh, so those are all the positives. Of course, now you're generating more metal, and we do have a partner that's going to take, um, you know, half the gold and 75 percent of the silver. And then you do obviously have uh, revenue royalties to the government that will take their share of that. But overall, on a net basis, you know, it, it has a positive impact for us as a project proponent. Yeah, because the expansion revenue is not proportional to, to expansion and cost. This is most correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so so it's it, it's it's very very attractive if it can be done, and we'll see how significant it turns out to be. But uh, what wh- when do you expect to kind of know what the impact might be? Then? Well, the 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 testing is underway right now uh, to look at some of these uh, optimizations, some of these changes. I'd say you know between that and some of the other programs that we have in place. Uh, investigating, uh, you know, other contractors, investigating 
the equipment. You know, we'd like to be in a position here before year end to provide, you know, at least in terms of some degree of disclosure uh, to, to, to speak to timing and, you know, expected costs or cost adjustments to, uh, to complete the project. Would you also communicate potential capex impacts then as well? Would it be a kind of a, a wholesome update in that regard? Uh, it would be it would be nice to do that, and and we'd like to do that. We also have to be cognizant that um, that could trigger a requirement to, to sort of update a, a technical report, yes. which you know, not that we're against that, but in terms of priorities, when we just want to get on to build the project that we feel comfortable with building because it's got these positives. Um, so, so a number of things to consider in that. Uh, first thing, though, clearly is to do the right work and to get comfortable with the, 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 the path forward uh, and all the conversations that we're having, um, you know, are so far speaking to positives from a timing and a cost, uh, cost considerations. Right. So... I guess just briefly to comment on Salazar as your your new sort of structured partner with, with uh, within the asset. Could you just uh, no need to expand too much on it, but just comment on your experience with them so far? How you envision that partnership to develop into the future? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's uh, it's interesting because we've mentioned that we've looked at this project over the years and it wasn't right before, but then it became right given the change in circumstances. You know, we have a pre-existing relationship with uh, Salazar. Uh, you know, uh, Ree knows Freddie Senior probably uh, more than a dozen years. Been down to visit, um, been to Ecuador before. We've looked at other things in Ecuador, but you know, never never moved on them in the past. So you know, circumstances obviously here are uh, different and better. Uh, I'd say there's a, um, a a common spirit between the two, in the sense that they're uh, geologists. Uh, and you know, can see the vision in terms of geology, but they're also pragmatists and think about how does this translate and turn into a business. Uh, having their support, you know, in country is is invaluable. Uh, they're they're keen to see you know the this project to be built and to be a bit of a um, you know uh, a legacy. You know, not not so much you know from. Uh, from a personality standpoint, but again, contributing to uh, the fact that, you know, good geology and the building of mines, what can it do for the country? And what yes, kind of- and it? I know that you're very much of the mind that let's get the first thing done, build the initial mine before even starting discussing the next steps. Like, uh, we're, we're certainly, I'm gonna force you to discuss Conrad, and I think you're, you, you would be willing to do that too, but I would like to also kind of uh, impress upon people, I guess, then, you would expect you were going to continue to work, to work with successful explorations in a country like Salazar to potentially make new, new near mine discoveries at Kuripamba as well. Uh, yes, yes. I think, uh, you know, you mentioned Condor and, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about Condor. Um, so, so we will. Um, I think when you look at El Domo, the, really the, the priorities are on the back of the permit and the expectations of what that project can be and should be. You know that is the the, the clear focus, and um, the more that we spend on other things and extensions before we even have the mine built, I mean that's that's present value dollars going out the door that aren't necessarily bringing anything in in terms of present value or NPV when we've got a buildable project. So I, I think we should, as it relates to you know El Domo and Curiapamba, let's focus on that for now. Um, at the other end of at the other end of the list, there's a whole bunch of other projects that we've inherited uh, from Adventus, uh, ones they had had, and ones that came across from Luminex. You know, those are on the list. Uh, we have a team evaluating those right now, looking at that, figuring out um, you know where they fit in terms of priorities. Um, you know, who should keep them, how, what should get done to them. Um, We'll start making decisions on that, but I don't think those will really, you know, move the needle materially in the near term. Condor uh, is an exception. Obviously, that is a project that's had uh, meaningful uh, expenditures. Um, of course, yeah. in, in terms of of looking at, it, you know, over eighty million has been spent on that. Um, some fairly significant drilling. 
they put together um, some resources, you know, um, indicated and inferred you know, 2.3 million and sort of uh, four and a half million ounces, uh, respectively. Uh, they did a PEA in 2021. We're not really talking to that PEA a lot. Uh, we're not, you know, using that in terms of our disclosure. It was a uh, large capex, uh, large tonnage, low grade open pit. And we don't necessarily think that's the right, you know, philosophy here. And it's not just that, that uh, you know, that uh, we want to ch change a project. It's going back to first principles and seeing in the geology, there's a number of zones that are um, decent widths, but very high grade cold. And from uh, topography, a permitting standpoint and capital, you know, we think there could be an opportunity to, to build a underground high grade, you know, gold mine. Uh, at Condor. And so right now our work is focused on testing that hypothesis. Uh, a key guy has, uh, is going to be spending, well, is in the midst of sort of spending the better part of six weeks on site, uh, going through and helping to rationalize a number of databases that have been collected by a few different parties, uh, look at where we might have some gaps in information to test our hypothesis, um, which could lead to a drill program to validate some of that information or, or some of those expectations. And then honestly, I'd love to see a situation where we look at uh, ramping down um, to do sort of more advanced exploration with the view that if we see what we like, we'll be in a position to, uh, to permit and start a more modest mine that we could then grow out of cash flow. Okay, so let's just unpack that in a little bit, but I just want to make a couple of remarks first with, with I mean, we know that wheat turns a stream, and this is a bit telling, of course, and you have uh, drill intersects that has kind of started to confirm other VMS targets close to Gripamba, and wheat turns a stream has a claim on other VMS discoveries in the region, which I think is quite telling on what they think to be the potential there. And I'll just leave that, that hanging. And then in terms of, of Condor, uh, Condor is, is very close to the prolific, of course, through the Norte discovery, which I think is worthwhile is getting out there in yeah. terms of the potential there. Right? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a different area. It's like 33 kilometers south of Futa del Norte. Uh, it's a different environment, obviously, different type of mineralization. It's not a, not a VMS um, in terms of package. Uh, it's actually... Uh, there's some geological similarities uh, in terms of some of the host environment to Karangas, uh, just for your uh, for your information. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Sure. But but what we're what we're targeting at, at Condor is a different approach and looking at that um, uh, differently. Um, mm. And you know this would be one of these examples uh, that is similar to other situations from a corporate development standpoint where we look at projects that are being proposed or being advanced. And, um, and this is why we're a first principles kind of group. We go in and say, okay, well, you have this project, let's throw away these studies because when we go back and look at it from the beginning, you know, we sort of scratch our heads and say, well, why would you want to spend, you know, 600 million, in terms of money that is really not readily available in the in the in the equity markets or in the capital markets to try to build this large you know low grade project when you have actually what looks like a very profitable starter project starter business and you can grow it from there and so that's kind of an approach that we've we've turned a number of open pit projects into underground. You just haven't heard about them because we weren't able to arrive at a deal to uh, to to yeah, acquire yeah, them yeah. and advance them. Um, and you guys but, have employed this model successfully with Ying. Of course, you're starting starting small and then building up, and it's yes, it's proven I, very good. I'm glad you mentioned that, so I didn't have to. Exactly, uh, but but yeah. but yeah, but of course, I mean, for the Norte is a low sulfidation kind of tier one tier one discovery and it's it's growing and it, it's it's not the same but it, it certainly gives credit to it's still proximate it's st still sort of in the same region i think also it speaks to the feasibility of actually running and building that from a community community point of view as well and so on so i i like uh, i like that fact a lot but let's speak about corner so, so what precisely do you think needs to be done because you're imagining this as a high-grade underground mine 
to 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 arrive at certainty or or, or more clarity that that's a feasible and uh, a, a superior plan from Silvercorp's point of view than a big open pit. What needs to go into to that? Do you need to drill more? What what do you need to do? And how yeah, I think we'll, I think we'll, we'll I think we'll probably have to do some drilling, exact amount to be to be determined. And I don't have the answers now because the the team has to. Uh, evaluate and digest all the information and collect it and put it into kind of our format in terms of how you know we like to see it. And as I said, there was a number of different parties, so the the, the data is a bit uh, scattered. So we have to collect all of that, and then once we've pulled it together, uh, I expect we'll see some spots where uh, we'll we'll wish there was more drill information from a few zones. And uh, so I think getting a drill campaign to test that. And then I think if those results are, are positive, you know, we'd be in a position to say, OK, this is looking like the kind of deposit and the, the, the kind of mine that we think it could be. You know, what do we do next? Is it a uh, drill a bunch more? Is it uh, do a, um, a fairly in the grand scheme of things, you know, modest exploration tunnel or drift down to actually open up and to, to get right in front and to see what it looks like. Uh, and then, of course, with that ties into that is sort of all the uh, the access and permitting rights that we'll need to do that. So uh, it's not going to be um, um, obviously as fast as El Domo, you know, given the, the, the stage of study and the permit status. Um, but I think in the next sort of uh, the next year and a bit, you know, we should be uh, uh, able to uh, come to the market and explain what we're seeing and what we think it can be. Okay, so if we just wrap the Ecuador segment here or sort of the advanced acquisition segment by just summarizing what, where do you want to be with that part of the portfolio by the end of next year? It will be uh, shortly here uh, explaining our plans for El Domo and anticipating that we'll, we'll have a, a formal construction, you know, kickoff uh, early in the new year for El Domo. And that's what's going to be required. And that's what the schedule speaks to, to be in a position where you're mining ore in the sort of the second half of 2026. Perfect. And then with Condor, you expect to be in a position to, to by the end of, of next year? To well, I think we'll have news. We'll have news here in terms of what our plans are, uh, what our spending might be, you know, in the next six months, if not sooner, in terms of what at least the next steps are and what we, you know, we're communicating what we think this can become in terms yeah. of, uh, of, a, of a project, you know, as we start to see, uh, you know, validation of that, you know, we'd like to be able to explain to the market what it is and, you know, why we're allocating budget to it. You know, we're, we're prepared to allocate budget to the project, the question is, is, is uh, we don't know what those budgets are yet based on, uh, on on what the data says to us. And would you expect that to be sort of in the same communication as El Domo? Uh, you just do both at once? Not necessarily. Not, not necessarily. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then we have to check in on New Pacific briefly here. What's your yes. expectation for new, your New Pacific investment in the next year? Well, I think things are progressing as we expected. Uh, obviously, Silver Sand has continued with the, with the PFS that was announced to, to continue to show good economics. Uh, the objective there is to advance the permitting. I think progress is being made on that front, uh, but it's a um, um, you know it's going to take the time that it takes to get those those negotiations completed. So we're a supportive, patient shareholder. I think the exciting news is that the PEA on Karangas is uh, expected uh, imminently. And um, I think the company has been communicating what the strategy on Karangas is in this PEA, which is to look at a sequenced development plan with the initial focus being on uh, what could be or should be an economic uh, silver focused mine initially. Mm -hmm. And something yeah. that that could be buildable from a from a developer standpoint or um, an intermediate company, not sort of the big, large scale bulk tonnage type project that uh, I think people were expecting out of Karangas, which would have limited the audience and the capacity for a company like New Pacific to move ahead because of the financing that would be required.
So I think they've been communicating what those expectations are. I think the positive is, is that a lot of people don't seem to be hearing it. And I think Karangas could be a positive uh, surprise for many people because of that. Very true. But in terms of Silver Sands, it sounds like you would expect that a decision point for the asset is going to happen uh, in 2025, i.e. a, a a decision who and who's going to build this is going to likely happen during that year. I I, I would uh, I would hope so because that would mean that uh, a box has been checked on the on the permitting front, and yep. that'll mean uh, uh, a number of interesting decisions that need to be made by a number of parties. Precisely, and let's just put it this way: I mean, you're you're the biggest individual shareholder of New Pacific as Silver Corp, so. It's going to be a decision point for Silver Corp what they're going to do uh, with with that, this investment. If it's going to be, you know, we, we, we've outlined the various permutations in the past. And they yes. persist. Yeah, yeah, still persist. And, and I think the interesting uh, question here is, is with Karangas, both on the PEA and then potentially being in a different permitting environment, um, yeah. could Karangas catch up and potentially leapfrog Silver Sand? And what could that mean for the company and the shareholders? Uh, th that's an interesting permutation that I don't think the market is familiar with. Hmm. I guess we'll, we'll see if that starts to play out in the next sort of six six months here, and we can chat more about that then. I want yes. to throw you one quick curveball, Lon. You might be surprised by this one, but you still have an equity investment in Oh My Gold, which is a company that we have taken a look at. What's Silver Corp's position there? And you're a board member of that company too, so... Makes it potentially complicated to answer, but nevertheless, I'll. I'll well, no, no, I, point of view. I. I think uh, I think it's it's no secret. It's taken longer um, to to get the um, the, the the results uh, than expected and hoped, and it's taken longer for those results to get the expectation. Sorry, to get the um, the recognition that they deserve. Uh, but it's happening, and um, uh, as as a shareholder, we're, we're happy to see that. We're supportive of of, and we st we still think there's great potential in that asset going forward. Yeah, and we know that Silver Corp has, has actively engaged in an M and A opportunity not too many years ago in Guyana. And I, I would assume that you view you still view Guyana as an, an even more interesting jurisdiction potentially uh, at this point in time. It would be something that you could potentially take a look at. Uh, yes, I think our view of Guyana has only been confirmed by additional parties, you know, coming to the country and uh, making investments or seeking to make investments in, in the country and, and in different projects. So, yes. Perfect. So, so let, let's just do one kind of quick wrap up here about the capital allocation strategy going forward. Of course, you're going to allocate to Aldoma and so on, but let's just speak about the strategic thinking. So. Again, just quickly clarify, what's your financial position for, for those who don't know? You have a lot of cash. Do you have any debt right now, et cetera? No debt. Credit. No debt. No, yeah, we have, we have no debt. Um, cash, as of reported at June, $216 million. Um, yep. Obviously generating free cash flow from our assets, even while we're investing in those growth programs in China. And... Uh, um, uh, you know, going forward, we expect that to continue to be the case with uh, the robust uh, pricing environment that we're seeing. And, you know, we'll, we just um, obviously uh, um, we have Eldomo to build and we've talked about the financing on that and how we can we can manage that. And uh, we remain active looking at other opportunities. So I think not not really a lot has you know changed in terms of our, our strategy going forward. Obviously, we have. Uh, uh, some additional expenditures related to Ecuador as we advance the project, but I think we're in very good, very good condition. I think Ying Ying's improvement offsets that, so you kind of remain in the same position in terms of mandate to that you have to deploy more capital. In my point, from my point of view, but can I just ask you one thing? What kind of credit and debt do you think do you have available to to yourself currently? What's that capacity you would say for Silver Corp? As it stands. Uh, uh, I, I can't say that we've looked at that in any uh, great detail. I, I think um, we will investigate that when you know the need arises to uh, to do that. Uh, debt and mining companies can be a good thing, but also um, you know can, can be a double edged sword. So we'll be very you know prudent if if and when we decide to uh, to bring debt into the mix. 
Yeah, but, but, but put it this way, it's something that you would consider for, for an acquisition and a build potentially. Well, I think I think the yes, potentially. And and again, you know, we've got to manage I mean, the the list for Neon Saga, obviously. So obviously that was a there obviously a, there were a big debt package plan, sort of. Yeah, there would have been a debt package plan that would have been yeah. uh, tied to the project. Yeah, exactly. So so right. Uh, so uh, so so going forward, you know, we don't want to you know mortgage the entire company's future on the back of another project. Um, so I, th I think we you know, have to be very uh, prudent. If we took on debt to buy an existing producing asset, you know that would be uh, an opportunity possibly to have immediate cash flows from the asset that we've acquired. You know, go towards yeah. you know paying paying that debt down. Uh, but again, we, you know we've got to find something that we like enough. So new asset, it, it has to if it's a new asset and you want to take debt on a corporate level, it's essentially. Burdening Ying's cash flows and, and, and the existing cash by that it has to be a producer that straight away cash flows. If it's an acquisition, you need you need to in the in that that uh, project on the on that asset level. That's the philosophy. I, I think that uh, I think that's the way we need to focus it. Yes, yeah, and and not actually burden Ying with outside debt. Yeah, and then to clarify for people, the outstanding, let's say. I, Depends on if you reduce the capex or not, but let's just assume you don't. Let's say it's 70, 80 million of equity, I guess, needs to be contributed from, for Silver Corp or whatever mix you decide to go with to close the financing gap for for Krupama. Would you imagine that you're just going to play it flat, pay it flat cash or put some debt into the mix as well? Uh, what do you think is the outcome? Well, I, I think uh, I think what we need to understand is the schedule and the timing of those expenditures. Yep. Because we have cash on hand and we do have ongoing cash flow that we can draw upon. And then we have the ability to draw on, on funding from, uh, from, from Wheaton. Okay. So, so it's actually tremendous flexibility. Flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's very good. So kind of final, final topic of discussion, I guess, would be for us to explore how, because you're essentially, I would say almost, it's crazy to think, but you're almost in the same uh, situation that you were 12 months ago, <laughs> even though you've acquired something where you essentially have the impetus to employ sort of the same quantum of capital uh, into something else and essentially yeah. the same financing flexibility, even though you've added this, this new uh, close to production project here. So how are you guys thinking around that? And how has this, how has the approach changed with the, the new pipeline in mind when you have Condor and you have this imminent build going on? Yeah, well, well, I think the uh, the important thing is is to stay active in the process, and um, you know, for us to sort of shut down that process because we think we are sort of too busy to look at things, uh, I think would be a mistake. Because when you sort of wake up one day and say, "Okay, we're ready to look at things," and you switch the the process back on and look around and realize, "Oh, you know, that that was a good asset. It just transacted. We missed the chance at that." Uh, it, it's sort of a dangerous thing. And as I've you know, pointed out, if, if you look in through the, um, the story of these opportunities that we've had, uh, they, they haven't been necessarily, oh, here's a brand new introduction of a new asset and start to finish. It took, you know, happened in six, you know, three to six months. You know, these are things that have evolved over, over years in some cases in terms of the view of the asset, uh, uh, progress made, technically permitting, uh, valuation, changes in parties, uh, willingness to do a transaction. So I think we, you know, we need to stay active in, in the process that we've always been in. Uh, obviously, if we saw, saw a development asset that had, you know, needs for capital and human resource needs that completely overlapped with uh, El Domo, you know, that would be a challenging question. Um, but we would tackle that question if it comes up and figure out what the right answer is. Um, so it's, you know, if you don't do the work, you never get the choice in the option. Um, if you do the work, at least you have the option to, uh, to make a decision. Yeah, okay. Uh, so... so Right. 
So, so I was saying that if, if that were to be the case and we found a development asset, ideally it would slot in from a time frame uh, to come in, you know, after Eldomo, we could maybe redeploy the development team from Eldomo to the next one. Uh, the, the needs in terms of capital wouldn't overlap exactly, but if there was more overlap and it was important for us to achieve the goal, uh, we'll find a way to make it work. In the meantime. Okay. In the meantime, yeah. Yeah, in 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 the in the meantime, if we look around and we saw an opportunity to buy a production asset, you know, there's an acquisition cost to that, but there's immediate cash flow and immediate you know benefits uh, to the company in terms of uh, increasing our asset base, increasing our cash flow, increasing and diversifying our asset platform. So that would be a very different question. So, so, so let's deal with the permutations quickly, but sequentially here. So in the case of a producing asset, we know that you're sort of fairly metal agnostic at this point. So I don't need to ask you that. You're, you're open minded in terms of jurisdiction. Don't need to ask you that. But, uh, however, what I need to ask you is the quantums for an acquisition, the range. I mean, not the lower range, but at least explore what the upper range could be. And then we well, have a sense I, of potential debt and, and so on. Still, it's an indirect answer, but... I, I think uh, I think yes, that does speak back to your previous question, which you know I, I'm not sure I answered that well. But I think um, the nature of the asset and how much it can carry in terms of financing capacity is going to determine whether or not we uh, we can and would do it, and whether or not that financing capacity uh, can be linked to that asset, or does it sort of spread um the risk profile onto our other assets and and i think we we have to find the asset and figure out what the likely uh, acquisition cost would be in the debt capacity you know to answer that question you know it's yeah. it's if i were to say oh the limit is 200 million and the debt financing capacity is 50 million and the rest of it has to be equity at 150 that's not such a great picture if i said it's 400 million and you know 300 of it can be debt financed and 100 is equity financed if that 300 million in debt is tied to that asset yeah i mean it's a range but i would also be make the assumption that i mean there is a certain size of asset where there is a lot more competition and yeah, agreed. If, yes. if, if, if it's a producing producing asset, I mean, you guys are not one to overpay. We've seen you walked away several times. That's right. You don't overpay. So, which means that likely, I would I would venture to assume that that the more likely asset you potentially that, that will be producing, it might have some kind of problem where Silver Corp could resolve it. That could be one angle, or mm -hmm. it might be that it's a asset probably under a hundred thousand ounces gold equivalent because those are. Usually, not there's not as much interest in those types of assets. Yeah. Uh, and there you could see yeah. an accretion. And, and uh, you know, you could go on to sort of say, or jurisdictionally, um, it's a jurisdiction that other people aren't as comfortable with. Uh, so we also have to ask ourselves the question is, do we want to be going into those jurisdictions because there's an asset available and we're the only buyer because nobody else wants to be there? Uh, and yeah. we do we do ask ourselves those those questions. Um, and that's a, a significant uh, consideration. Uh, th there's other situations in terms of uh, is the vendor running a process or have we targeted the asset and presented the vendor with a uh, source of liquidity that they needed for other assets? Uh, and it's just, hey, this works, not an important asset to us in the grand scheme of things. We really need the money here. Okay, we could hire a bank and run a six-month process to get maybe a slightly better uh, consideration, but uh, Silver Corp have showed up on our door with a uh, an offer we can't refuse. So I, I agree with you with the with the, uh, the 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 premise in terms of of what what it is we can look at, and obviously we've been looking at producing assets through this whole piece, and it's been difficult uh, to find yeah. them. Uh, it's difficult to find assets generally that uh, that are as good as advertised and as a, at a price that uh, you know that you can stomach so I'm not saying it's going to be easy but th those are sort of the broad um, uh, criteria and and uh, uh, factors that we're applying to this uh, this process 
and the reason why it's it's even less competitive for you guys, I would say, and that's not, this is not all the case for all mining companies. You have uh, in-house competency, vertical competency from, from discovery all the way up to building and operating a mine, which is not the case for many other uh, uh, companies of your size or even companies in the industry, generally speaking, which means that you have the option. It, it becomes a lot more realistic for you guys to take on a build and do it successfully at, at budget, potentially even under budget and, and delivering on time. Yeah. So that yeah. makes those types of, of, of uh, opportunities even more competitive for you guys. So it sounds like probably fairly low, lower end of distribution in terms of likelihood of you acquiring a producing asset, but it's in the realm of consideration. If we talk about the development projects then, so it's, it's, it sounds like it's a no-no to do two builds simultaneously. At least that's excluded. But other than that... Well, I think... I think we have to look at I think we have to look at anything and if we get challenged by something that is a really great opportunity is go and evaluate at the time can we accomplish this what's needed how can we do this can we find a way of uh, acquiring it because it's for sale now and we can get it at an attractive price now and then how could we manage um, both projects at the same time and again just like the other situation until we find that um, until we find that scenario that we have to deal with, let's not talk ourselves out of out of looking for it. Yeah, but the, uh, to exclude some things, I mean, green fields is kind of like a, we don't even need to discuss it. I mean, you're planting no, green fields. No, 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 no. Our, our 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 criteria, yeah, our criteria remains the same, which is focused on um, a permitting asset, like a permitted asset well, that uh, yeah. that we can uh, we can come in and build. But I guess I would have assumed that a potential situation where an asset is, is advanced in terms of defining the resource, it's well understood geologically, maybe it's it's fairly well understood in terms of costs and so on and economically as well, but doesn't have a permit. You guys actually have the time to do that with the build of Curry Pound by Mine if it's at that pre-permit stage, that's the last puzzle piece. Are you willing to consider that? That would have been excluded previously, but now maybe it could be another sort of case because those exist out there. Well, yeah, I, I, I hear you, but like you, you can think you're such a genius and buy that project and say, oh, you know, the, the time frame that uh, it'll take to build El Domo will get the permit for this other project. And then we can move into construction right after. And then it takes five years to get the permit. And we've got uh, extra years of wasted time and money um, that... Um, uh, you know what was the rush to buy it? That's very back true. Then. But but to push oh. back, th those opportunities could also be a, very cheap due to that very reason. So it's kind of a, I guess. But it sounds you have an aversion to that specific time risk. It's what it sounds. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I you know I think if you look at if you look at what we've we've bought here, you know we've we've bought a permitted asset in El Domo, and we've got an unpermitted Condor Gold project for free. Yeah. So you you have that. So so we we've we've gotten that um, for free, and we've taken on an undetermined you know permitting process that we think we have a team that's been successful on the other asset in the country, uh, in a country that uh, seems to be opening up and warming up to mining assets. So I think that's good. You know, name X Y Z company and step in and say, okay, we think we can get this permitted in three years. Well, if we're wrong and it takes six or eight or 10, you know, we've really deviated from our strategy and we'll have spent shareholders, shareholders money or shares to buy something that doesn't fit into our development strategy. Yeah. 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 I mean, in that sort of situation, the, the acquisition cost would, would likely be quite small since it's pre-permit, but uh, yeah, well, I do very much. There, there's a lot of a uh, lot of development projects that the market seems to love that have, uh, you know, 200 million market caps, no permit. Sure, sure, but uh, th they are kind of pre pre excluded. I would say. I mean, that's sort of a major setup play usually in, in that in that case. I would say at least. But we, we don't need to get into the corporate development rigmarole discussion here, I guess. But uh, no, no, and, and I, I don't want to. Uh, you know, I don't want to be the person basically uh, pointing out sort of all the companies out there that people seem to love that have problems with them. But I think there are a number of companies out there that you could. There's um, different ways to succeed in this industry though. So there's different yeah. strategies yeah. That, that do work. Yeah. 
but uh, so so uh, how and if you put this into relation to direct returns you're still doing your dividend you're still doing buybacks and so on so if you if you put that into the discussion how how does that slot into next year well, no, no, no. I, I think I think it's uh, it's fair to say we're still paying our dividend, and as we've always said, the, the dividend is, um, especially at, at these price levels, is more symbolic than anything. Um, but we're not increasing the dividend because that would limit our funding to go and grow and diversify, and seek a better uh, valuation for the platform. The, the 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 buyback to be very clear is having a tool in the toolbox that's available if and when we need it. It doesn't mean we're doing the buyback. Yeah, and, so the buyback and, tactical dividend symbolic and we're going to remain small, not going to increase. Like that. well, no, no, the 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 dividend is symbolic, and it's 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 it, we're paying that dividend, and I can't comment, but I don't see us changing that. The the buyback is a tool that we have in place that uh, we could employ it's under certain situations. Yeah, so yeah. it's a tactical tool. So it's not going to be a major, it's not a, it's tactical, it's not a strategy, put it that way. Um, uh, correct, guess, yes. Yeah, so, so, so that's, that's very good. It's still, it's still sort of unchanged. Essentially, your corporate development effort is unchanged. It's still going to be sort of actually kind of full blaze in terms of uh, looking and pursuing things. Y yes. And I guess uh, that's hopefully a comprehensive snapshot in time again here for where Silver Corp is at. So I think it's a pretty good, good place to wrap things up on. Uh, great update, and I hope to to bring you back on maybe after the uh, clarification for Kripamba mainly. Expect sometime early next year, I would assume. I uh, or late this year, yeah. I, you know, we're, we're 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 working as quickly as we can to wrap up these elements and get a, a concrete strategy and plan going forward. Uh, and like I said, everything is pointing in the right direction. Uh, but as we get those details, we, you know, we know shareholders in the market will be keen to understand, you know, what this asset is going to contribute, what it's going to cost, and when we expect it. So, you know, we we recognize getting that information uh, out, and I think there can be updates on Condor and Ying and stuff uh, in the meantime as we continue to advance that, um, you know, those, those projects. And you know, Ying, there's a number of um, you know upcoming milestones um, uh, that you know we've identified once. Uh, uh, we, you know, we've got more concrete things in place, like the mill completion, tailings facility done. Um, you know, news on you know increasing the, the the throughput to hit those targets. You know, those are all news items that I think will be confirmatory that we're on the path that we've laid out here. Yep. Okay, we're looking forward to that. So, uh, best of luck, and we'll speak to you in a few months from now. Hopefully. That's great. Thanks, Corm. Appreciate it as always.